to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Anna and I think I'm crooked. Let me just adjust myself. I hope that's better. Um, my name is Anna and I am a, I guess I could say I'm a booktuber now. I have a channel where I talk about books um, in the form of monthly wrap ups. I just did my first one and posted it recently. Um, I posted about two days ago. I'm filming this on Sunday, March 5th. Yes, March 5th. Um, and my first one came out on Thursday, March 2nd, I believe that's when it came out. So not too long ago, maybe it came out on Friday, I can't quite remember. But I decided I would jump on a trend that I saw going around booktube that's 23 books for 2023. And I put them all in my Goodreads, which I love the Goodreads app. And I have about 100 books that are on my to be read shelf in Goodreads currently and now the camera is gonna screw up with my lighting but let me try to lower the brightness a bit there we go okay that's better um so i have about 23 books that i put i have 23 books rather that i put together that i want to read in 2023 out of my 100 books that i have in my to be read list on goodreads they don't include books I'm currently reading. I am currently reading both A Good Man is Hard to Find, which is the short story collection by Flannery O'Connor with the title story as her main most famous one. And I'm also listening to The Green Mile by Stephen King on audiobook. I'm also not including any of the books I read already beforehand. So these are all books in addition to the ones I've read and I'm currently reading. So I set a very modest goal for myself because I'm just getting back into reading of only reading eight books for 2023 and I've currently read six I'm going to be close to finishing up to eight between the two I'm reading now and um, I did that because I just wanted to get back into reading I wanted to set smart goals but I saw that it was going very quickly for me so I upped it a little I think I'll up it a little bit I don't know if I'll officially up it but these are 23 books I want to read in 2023 I did end up upping it to nine because if you from eight because if you watched my last video I told you about how I had finished a good no such a fun oh, words I told you I had finished such a fun age on audiobook and I was mostly done with such a fun age but then I decided to go back and finish it sort of as like an extra motivation you know how if you're starting to work out they tell you to take it easy the first day and build up gradually same thing if you're saving money start saving like a small amount of money then you save more it becomes more habitual same idea so I struck, set my goal really low but because I was almost finished with such a fun age I ended up upping it to nine so my current goal is nine but these are 23 books I would like to read in 2023 in addition to the eight that are in progress or finished make sense okay so in no particular order I'm going to go through a book uh, my list of books they are a variety of books of, on a variety of topics the majority of them are fiction they were all written at different times so without further ado here we go the first book um, and this is not chronological this is not in order of what I'm most excited to read I just happen to add them from my to be read list and tag them on 23 books for 2023 a Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. This is a dystopian book that I've heard so much about. I've read the synopsis of it. I love a good dystopia. I'm not really a sci-fi person, but I love dystopian literature. 1984. I think everyone loves 1984. I don't think I've ever met anyone who doesn't at least appreciate what 1984 represents, even if they didn't love the actual act of reading it. You don't really realize how much in our culture, like the term Big Brother and um, what's the other one? Double Speak. Those come from 1984. These were things that were made up, not made up, I guess they always kind of existed conceptually, but these are terms that came from this book that was so influential. And I know Brave New World is right up there with 1984. It, I think it just has more mature content, if I'm not mistaken, so it's not read in schools as widely. Um, there are a lot of dystopians. I would, dystopian novels I would like to read, and there's another one on this list, and there are several in my to-be-read list. So that's one that I'm really excited to read. I feel like I'll feel a lot more well-read, a lot more um, not necessarily educated, but maybe my critical thinking skills will expand a bit, so I'm excited to do that. The next one is The Alchemist by Paul, Paulo Coelho. Um, this is a famous book. It's very short. I think it's 175 pages. It has really mixed reviews on Goodreads. It has rated 3.9, but this came highly recommended to me from someone. It's actually his favorite book. And I had already had it on my list, so because it's his favorite book, and because also the short 
length of it kind of appeals to me. I feel like I can finish it really quickly. I'm going to bump this one up and I would like to do that. I know my library has a copy of it because I saw it the last time I was there and I didn't pick it up the last time, but probably my next library trip I'll pick it up because that's an easy one to knock out and uh, he spoke so highly of it, so I'm excited to read that. I have a couple books that I just recommended from other people or who want to read it with me, so that's definitely in the category. It's supposed to be very philosophical, but digestible, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. The next book I actually have with me, which I don't know if I've really explicitly said, but I have a very small um, collection of books that I actually have on my shelf. I have a very small bookshelf, and I don't like to... Well, that's not true. I, <laughs> I was going to say I don't like to accumulate things, but I'm trying to be better about just accumulating things. And I feel like books are kind of a gamble. It's kind of like buying jeans online with no return policy. Like you hope they work, but they might not. And then you're kind of stuck. Or even like buying like body suits online. If you've ever done that, you're stuck with them because they're considered intimates. So I feel like buying books is kind of like that. You can resell them. And I, I guess you could return a book, but I don't know anyone who's done that. It would have to be in perfect condition. So I prefer to get them from the library and then if I love them, I will buy the copy unless I get a gift card or something like that or it's really cheap on eBay or something. This book is Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides. I did read The Virgin Suicides about five years ago and I enjoyed it, but it wasn't super plot heavy. Um, there was a lot of imagery which was really interesting, but it, I, it wasn't, I thought it was a little overhyped. But I've heard Middlesex is really good. Um, it sounds interesting just from the opening page that I read. I got this at the library, but I actually bought it because my library has a section of books that are for sale for very cheap, their donations. And I guess for whatever reason, they don't want to have them in their stock. Maybe they have a lot of them, but they'll sell them and the funds go to support the library. So I bought this and one other book and I think I had $6 cash that I gave or maybe $5 cash for both of them, which was the recommended donation rate. So I'm happy to support the local library and get this book that was already in my to be read list. And I kind of like that I have a copy of this because I can take my time with it. Also, if I travel, I don't really want to travel with a library book. Um, and I don't want to have to worry about rushing through it if it's renewed because this is a very thick book. It has how many pages? It's over 500. Um, we're at 525. It's not quite done. So it's, it's quite a thick book. The I read the opening line just because I wasn't sure about it from the you know, virgin suicides. But this is the opening line that I think is absolutely fascinating. I was born twice, first as a baby girl on a remarkably smogless Detroit day in January of 1960, and then again as a teenage boy in an emergency room near Petoskey, Michigan in August of 1974. That's fascinating. That draws you right in. And this was published in the 2000s, the early 2000s, I want to say like 2005. So this was before we really understood things about gender, and I've been told that this is one of the most fascinating protagonists of all time. Oh, I'm sorry, 2002. I just looked at the the cover, the inside cover page. 2002. So this is really interesting. I've been told the protagonist is just fascinating and a great narrator. So this is definitely on my list, especially because I'm very insecure about not being very well read, and this is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize. This was also recommended to me years ago actually for the same trip when I read The Virgin Suicides in the airport, I had gone on to Facebook and asked for recommendations for reading because I hadn't read in a while, I didn't know it was trending, and that's actually when I read Sputnik Sweetheart, which was recommended by a childhood friend of mine, and that's one of my favorites. And my high school English teacher had said, try Middlesex, and when I Googled it, I said, actually, I already have The Virgin Suicides in progress, and she liked that. So I'm gonna hope that she, you know, has the good recommendation, I'm sure she does. I just know sometimes we don't quite see eye to eye on our taste because I remember in high school I told her the Poisonwood Bible was one of my favorite books and she said she couldn't get into it but that's one book so Middlesex is on my list for a variety of reasons and I'm glad to have a copy of it in such fantastic condition too okay we'll put that one right behind me so I don't pick it up again by accident the next book is another one that I actually tried to read before in high school quite a long time ago my senior year of high school which was 10 years ago. <laughs> 10 years ago, I was a senior in high school. I was getting ready for graduation. Um, I was about to turn 18 10 years ago. Wow. <laughs> okay, anyway, getting beyond that, it's Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil by John Berendt. B-E-R-E-N-D-T. Berendt? Brent? I'm not sure. Berendt. Um, 
Anyway, there was a movie made out of this book. I never saw the movie, but I had been to Savannah, to Savannah, Georgia as a child, and I thought it was absolutely enthralling. Just a gorgeous, lush, green, old, haunted kind of city. I always liked Savannah. Um, I had grandparents who lived very close to Savannah, so we had gone on a day trip and a tour, and this was probably around 2004, 2005, so the Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil was much more fresh in people's minds. I don't know when the movie came out, but I believe the book was written in the late 90s. I don't have a copy with me. I'm not going to Google the copyright, but um, that's why it was such a... So it was a title I always heard growing up. Um, my mom had read it. It was on her bookshelf. And then I had started to read it in high school, and I think it wasn't that I didn't like it. I think I just got busy and was getting ready for college and the end of the year, and I just kind of abandoned it. It wasn't my priority anymore. But I remember enjoying reading it. Um, and ironically, this has become a very difficult book for me to come by. I can't find it in my local library. I can't find it in the card catalog, so I might have to end up ordering this one on eBay or through a secondhand bookstore somewhere, or maybe if I get a gift card for my birthday, um, set aside some money for that and go to a Barnes & Noble or something. So my birthday is coming up. That's part of the reason why I'm <laughs> saying, oh, 10 years ago I was doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, I'll be 28 on the 28th, so that's very exciting. Um, anyway. That's uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. I just love the title. It's so intriguing, so fascinating. Um, it's about a murder, and the interesting thing is it seems like a lot of the characters in this book, and they're characters, like you just, they're so entertaining to read about um, in every which way. You get the sense some of them are kind of scammers. Some of them are a little like Great Gatsby-esque. Uh, they have these lush parties. They're drag queens, like really cool stuff. I love some good Southern literature. Um, and a lot of them are tr real people, based on real people. This writer, I believe, lived in Savannah for a very long time, and these are inspired by the actual people he knew. Now, the plot that develops around it, I don't know if it's quite true, but it was really, I remember it being a very entertaining read, and I think I will enjoy picking this up again. And it will probably be a book I'll read during the school year, because I, as I've said before, I work in a school and I work retail. And while I'm enjoying the Green Mile right now, sometimes when I have a very emotional day, that's not really what I want to dive into on my free time, as much as it's, you know, interesting and everything. Um, I'm also not the biggest Stephen King fan. I've read Carrie, which I really liked, but I like coming of age novels a lot. And I, um, I read his book on writing, which I enjoyed because he's very funny. So I think this is a good school year book not like a spring break book not a summertime book not a you know waiting in the airport type book I think this is a good book for me to read like during my week if that makes sense I don't know if people think about books that way but I know people think about beach reads and things like that I guess this is my equivalent of a beach read but I live in Florida so the beach is plentiful I mean thankfully I'm not saying that in a negative way so I guess like my definition of a beach read is a little different and I typically don't go for beach reads but Anyway, I'm going to move on. The next book is different from the others. I think it's the newest release that I've talked about so far. Yes, I believe so. It's My Body is a Book of Rules by Alyssa Washuda. I'm going to say everyone's name wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, and it seems like a short little book. I was interested in this because someone I went to high school with who works in publishing, she had read this book and she rated it very highly and she's very interested in... Um, she started a feminist literary magazine when she was in school, and she's really got some eclectic taste. I really enjoy following her on Goodreads. I, she's not like super well known, but I kind of, I take her recommendations with a little more weight just because this is her world. Um, and it just looks really intriguing. It seems to be about a woman's sexuality and, um, you know, thinking about that in terms of all the dangers that go along with being a woman. I can't quite remember if it's fictional, but like partially autobiographical, and it, it seems pretty short, um, but it might be a heavy read, so I'm intrigued by it. I also saw Ketavon Reads has it on their, her to be read list, or she was reading it. I didn't watch the video all the way, but I remember she was like holding a stack of books and it was there, or it was in her description or something. So two people who have really cool taste in books are reading it, and um, I think that that warrants a place on my 2023 reads. The next book is completely different from the others. Um, it is nonfiction. It's called Bullshit Jobs, A Theory by David Graeber. David Graeber is someone I read 10 years ago, 
in my freshman year of college, my first semester, I was assigned to read his article um, but, uh, that informed the book called On the Phenomenon of Bullshit Jobs. And that is an article that has stuck with me for probably my whole life since then. Um, he talks about how a lot of the work that we do nowadays is maybe not the most meaningful and wh why are we living like this and why, and this is written pre-COVID, so you know it seems to be pushing back now, but why are we working 40 hours a week when we could accomplish the same amount in probably eight hours a week or 10 hours a week because technology has come so far and why is it that work is, that work that is so meaningful and so important to the functioning of our society is often so looked down upon and not compensated very well. And why do we do things in such an inefficient way if in capitalism we're supposed to be efficient and communism was supposed to be the system that was inefficient and decried as such and we see similar things replicated. Um, that's the summary. I will put the link to the article in the description so you can read more ways talking about. He's not necessarily advocating for um, one way or the other. I don't want people to watch this and think that he's super um, like pro-communist or pro-capitalist or anything like that. As far as I can tell, he's sort of just analytical and um, looking at things. He also revisited his theory um, not quite 10 years later because I believe that the original article came out in 2013 and obviously it's 2023. But there was one that came out that said something like David Graeber revisits his article, I don't know, like uh, eight years later, I think. Maybe it was 10 and I just read it in 2013. I don't know. But he talked about how this inefficiency, he feels like his, he had felt like his theory real, really held up. And this is pre-COVID that he was talking about. Because if you looked at the Affordable Care Act, this was um, something that was supposed to help. Now, your opinions on it might be one way or the other, but the idea behind the Affordable Care Act, whether it was executed or not, was to help sort out a very bloated, bureaucratic, inefficient, expensive system that was purely capitalist because U.S. healthcare is capitalist and to make it more efficient and less bloated. And Obama at the time when he was, I don't remember if it was when he was president or if he was reflecting on his presidency, but he had said, he was quoted saying something to the effect of, yes, we did a lot of good, but at the end of the day, 25% of our GDP is healthcare, so we can't really get rid of it. And Graeber points to that as the smoking gun for his theory, right? Because you have some, a system that is so inefficient that we would probably all be better off, at least maybe not, I wouldn't say without, but with with major overhauls, right? We all struggle under this um, system. I was a public health major too, so you know, no one likes going to the hospital and not knowing what they're gonna pay or not knowing how much their, um, I don't know, their medicine costs or it costs, dip, or there's no generic option available or you know, one month your prescription could be 30 bucks, the next month it could be $2,000 overnight. No one likes that. That's not serving anyone except a very, very small amount of people. So. That's the basis of his work and his theories from what I've read without reading his whole book. I will link both those articles below because I think they're so fascinating and what an incredible theorist. I think he's passed since writing these. I believe he's passed away, but I'm not 100% sure. So Bullshit Jobs is something that's been on my list for a very long time and I finally wanna get around to reading it. I also think it'll make me feel very validated in my work as a guidance counselor because I can sort of measure the import I guess you can and can't measure the importance of it because sometimes it's more qualitative than quantitative but I feel like that's very much not a bullshit job so I, sometimes I need a little validation um, so that's that's the first nonfiction book on here the next book I want to read in 2023 is convenience store woman by oh let me make sure I say her name Sayaka Murata and again so sorry um, for mispronouncing everything just in advance and until the end of time. So sorry. Sayaka Murata, Convenience Store Woman. This book is so intriguing and I've heard so much about it. I know Modern Ajuma, who is a booktuber I absolutely love, has read this and it just looks funny. This is a woman uh, in a Japanese convenience store. My understanding is it's the equivalent of like a 7-Eleven and all the people in her life are saying you should get a real job. She's a bit older. She's not young. I think she's in her 30s or 40s. Like, you should get a real job. You know, you should do X, Y, and Z. You should find a man. You should settle down. And she's just not into it. She likes her life at the convenience store. Um, I think because I work retail, I, as, in addition to my guidance counselor job, I will really appreciate this book. 
And then simultaneously, one of my favorite TV shows of all time is Superstore, which is a hilarious TV show. Even if you've never worked retail, you'll like it. And there's a lot of emotional range and great storytelling and a variety of characters in that show, which I really appreciate. Um, I wish it got more acclaim. I really do. I think it deserves the same acclaim as The Office and Parks and Rec, if not more, because there is such a range in that show. And they talk about without being forced in most cases there are a few episodes that it got a little forced but in most cases they bring up such um topical and kind of distinctly american issues in such a comical but heartbreaking way so really i love superstore that's like my one tv recommendation because i don't have a tv which someone doesn't really like about me um so that's why I think I really want to read Convenience Store Woman. It's a short little book too. You'll notice a lot of these books are short and part of that is because I'm insecure about being not very well read and I want to be more well read. So part of me wants to do a little more quantity. Um, moving on, because this video is going to be forever and ever and ever. Maybe I'll do part one, part two. Um, Play It As It Lays by Joan Didion. This is a book that um, I did the Rory Gilmore reading quiz like and I checked off all the ones I had read and I got like 9% before I started reading this year and I started to feel really insecure and this was on there and it sort of caught my eye it's about the 60s and I've heard it's very dark and that's kind of all I know about it but I I'm intrigued I think Joan Didion's one of our great American writers so I, I want to try it out the next book is a collection of poetry called Incarnadine by Mary Zibist Sizbist, S-Z-Y-B-I-S-T. The reason I want to read this is because she wrote one of my favorite poems, which I think is called Night Shifts in the Psych Ward or something like that. I'll link it down below, but it is so, so good. Um, I've always liked that poem. I don't remember where I first read it, uh, but I would really like to read the rest of her work just based on how much I like that poem. And I do like a good poetry collection, so that's one that I'm excited to read. The next book I actually also have the physical copy of. I ordered it on eBay. It's Are You There God? It's Me, Margaret. The movie is coming out in April and I am ashamed to say I haven't really read any Judy Bloom like ever. I don't know how I did that one. Um, but this is supposed to be an excellent book. I actually had originally bought it um, with the intention of loaning it to a student who really liked um, reading and I thought maybe it would be helpful for her because I just thought there could be some parallels there and I know Judy Bloom is good, but um, I haven't read it yet and so obviously I would have to read it and determine if it was something that was appropriate to lend out to a student. And then because I'm in Florida, we just had some new legislation over certain books in classroom libraries. So it's not gonna be given to the student after all, um, but that's why I bought it versus getting it from the library. I thought that she might like to read it and it might be helpful for her if she enjoyed it if it was appropriate, which I would have to, of course, determine. I wouldn't just give a book I've never read blindly to a student. Um, but there are other Judy Bloom books that are in the school library that I'll probably recommend to her. So this is one that I wanna read. It's a short little book, I think it's 200 pages. And it's a YA book, so like you can see, it's very spaced out. It's gonna be a quick little read. And you know, it's a classic book and I like to read books before I see the movie. I was thinking it would be really interesting to do part like a series of like the book versus the movie because there are a lot of books and tv shows i've never seen because i've had the i'm sorry movies and tv shows i've never seen because i've had the intention of reading the book like handmaid's tale never watched it because i want to read the book um cider house rules never seen it want to read the book so it would be kind of interesting to react to those and it might be cool to see the movie when it comes out so are you there god it's me margaret another classic that i am excited to read Oh, I need a little, little sip. This is some white wine that I got at Target because I'm very glamorous and very exciting. I don't even know what number we're on because I didn't number these on Goodreads. Uh, we're probably on about number 10. Yeah, close to 10. I gotta, I gotta speed up a little bit. I'm so sorry, guys. No one else except for some people I work with are really big readers currently, but we have very different tastes. And actually one book that I'm going to read with them is going to be on this list. So moving on, 
Brutes by Diz Tate. This is a new release that I, in my Google News page, it was recommended. I think it was NPR wrote about it. And um, it really intrigued me. It's supposed to be like Virgin Suicides-esque meets the Florida Project. I have never seen the Florida Project, but understand I'm a guidance counselor in Florida. So I know all about hotel kids. I have hotel kids. Like I, I feel like I already know the Florida Project without having seen it. Um, so it's the premise of this is that a girl who is like the popular cool girl in this very small town and I think it's in northern Florida not in south Florida where I am she goes missing and all the adults are very concerned and I think it's a very conservative Christian community and so the whole town is shocked by this as any town would be um, not just a conservative small town that's Christian anyone's shocked when people go missing it's a horrible thing especially young people um, but the girls who are teenage girls, preteen girls, I believe they're 13, they all seem to sort of know where she is, but no one's asking them. And so because no one's asking them, they're not saying anything. And it's like this unspoken code. So this is supposedly told through the first person plural. So there's a lot of, for example, we know what happened to her, but no one's asking us. And it's supposed to be very creepy and intrigued. I'm very intrigued by this. So I don't know that I love missing girl books, but just the narration of this and, you know, the setting sounds really intriguing. So that's one that actually my local library will be carrying if they're not carrying it already, because it just came out in February. Um, and I want to put a hold on that because that looks really good. That might have to be a, a spring break read because that might be too heavy for my soul during the school year, but it looks really interesting. The next one is Ghost Music by An Yu. Um, Anya, I don't know. Uh, it's a Chinese author, so I, pronunciation? Um, it is a book about a piano teacher in Beijing, a novel, and there's some sort of magical realism stuff that goes on and um, it just seems really interesting and unique and I'm intrigued by it. Uh, packages of mushrooms keep showing up at her door and no one knows why. So it's, I don't really know what to expect, but it seems interesting. I think it'll keep me guessing. So ghost music is on there. That's one that my library won't carry. So I'm going to have to find a way to order that. And that's a new release this year as well. The next book is a physical library book that I actually took out the last time I was there. Um, and it's a classic. It's The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. I have heard that this is an amazing classic that is so underrated. I've watched a lot of booktube and I've had multiple people who like classics, who like some classics say that this is such a good book. Um, and the I can read the back of it because it's very brief. At the staid Marsha Blaine School for Girls in Edinburgh, Scotland, teacher extraordinaire Miss Jean Brody is unmistakably and outspokenly in her prime. She is passionate in the application of her unorthodox teaching methods, in her attraction to the married art master Teddy Lloyd, in her affair with the bachelor music master Gordon Lowther, and most important, in her dedication to her girls. The students she selects to be her creme de la creme. Fanatically devoted, each member of the Brody set, Eunice, Jenny, Mary, Monica, Rose, and Sandy is famous for something. And Miss Brody strives to bring out the best in each one. Determined to instill in them independence, passion, and ambition, Miss Brody advises her girls, safety does not come first. Goodness, truth, and beauty come first. Follow me. And they do. But one of them will betray her. So this seems like a really good book. It's short. It's like 150 pages. But I've heard such wonderful things about this, and I think because I work in education, it might just, I, I might like it a little more, it might resonate more with me. So I'm excited to read this and also to feel less, less like I don't read anything, less like I can get roasted by my coworkers for not reading. So that's one that will be read probably very soon. I think I have two more weeks on that one from the library. The next book was recommended to me by a dear friend, Tamara, and it's called She's Come Undone by Wally Lamb. This is a book I think that was written in the early 2000s. Tamara has a wicked sense of humor, so she said she doesn't really like any books except this one. And I've heard that the protagonist can be very funny, but she also said it's dark. Tamara warned me there's some dark stuff in there. The reviews on Goodreads seem to be pretty good. 
except I think there's a lot of stuff around weight and um, the protagonist being very heavy and insecure about it and I think a lot of people took that very personally and very sensitively not really recognizing that the early 2000s and the 90s were a very different world in that time um, so I for me I don't think it's really gonna bother me but that might be something that that might be a reason why it's rated low on Goodreads if you were to look it up. She says it's really great. I'm excited to read it. Um, I think it might be dark because it sounds like this is a character who just sort of retreats further and further into her own world. Um, but I, I would take her recommendation seriously just because she's not a reader. So I almost feel like people who aren't readers, who have like their one or two books that they really like, they're the ones who you sometimes want to listen to more.